I'd now like to uh, introduce our next speaker. Mr. David Edward Edison Sloan is professor of English at the University of New Haven and author of several books on American humor and Mark Twain, including Mark Twain as a literary comedian in the literary humor of the urban Northeast, 1830 to 1890, which provides examples of how American humorists dealt with the emergence of modern industrial culture. He has also written and spoken on the life of his great-grandfather, Thomas Alvar Edison, and his grandmother, Madeline Edison Sloan. Please welcome David Sloan. Uh, first, it is a great pleasure to meet and to welcome a fellow scholar and a fellow great-grandson of an inventor who played a crucial role in the creation of recorded sound, Laurent Scott de Martinville, <laughs> and our kind ambassador, uh, Catherine Brezhniak, who has already taught me some things I didn't know. <laughs> Uh, I could not improve upon the information uh, that uh, Laurent and the other speakers will share at today's event, except from my own perspective as a student of American culture, American humor, and Mark Twain, and incidentally, in another way, as a teacher of public speaking at the University of New Haven. One of the observations that is made of Mark Twain's studies is that some Mark Twain scholars forget that Mark Twain was a humorist and that humor is a central component of American culture, just as music is a central component of world culture. And the miracle of recorded sound has allowed the wonders of music to be shared across time and national boundaries as never before in the history of mankind. When Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee, Hank Morgan, appears in King Arthur's court, courtesy of a knock on the head by a crowbar, he takes inventory among the marvels of modern technology which had not appeared in 528 AD until he invented them. The telegraph, the telephone, the phonograph, the typewriter, the sewing machine. By the time Twain published A Connecticut Yankee in 1889, sound recording was already changing the geography of human culture. The model for Hank Morgan, the Connecticut Yankee, was another Yankee by the name of P.T. Barnum. Barnum was an inventive genius of another sort. He invented a Fiji mermaid and humbugged thousands to view the concoction, the torso of a monkey sewed onto the body of a dried fish <laughs> in his American museum, for which he became both famous and notorious. But Barnum's greatest triumph, as told in his autobiography of P.T. Barnum in 1855, also focused on sound, bringing the Swedish nightingale Jenny Lind to America and taking her on tour, making both Jenny Lind and Barnum rich on the proceeds, incidentally. Jenny Lind's voice was a miracle of its time, but we shall never know what she sounded like. Yet we do know that the values of sound, like humor, moved the souls of her audience. A brief clip I play in my public speaking courses illustrates this fact and reminds us as well why we are here. Two very unpromising and unlikely contestants, Charlotte and Jonathan, ages 16 and 17 in 2012, when the clip was recorded on the television show Britain's Got Talent are the subjects, both singers. Simon Cowell, a contest judge, leans over to his colleague and mutters, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse. But the outcome was a revelation because those two kids sang beautifully and Cowell remarked, my God, he sounds just like Pavarotti. We cannot know what Jenny Lynn sounded like, but we can still join together in appreciating the greatness of musical talent we can hear, thanks to the work of de Martinville and Edison and those who followed both inventors were united in a wave of technology 
that sought to improve the lives of every one of us. In our recognition of the shared heritage of De Martinville and Edison, we celebrate this afternoon a small island of sanity and inquiry into the past, as well as optimism for the future, elevated by the most moving sounds of our shared culture. In opposition to the terrorists of Nice and Paris and New York and Boston and elsewhere, we focus our sights on the courage which the folk singer, folk song writer Pete Seeger called the golden thread of men going ever forth. And so we remember that both inventors worked in the same cause to bring the gift of recorded sound to represent the greatest aspirations of mankind. I look forward to today's insights, which thanks to these two great inventors and to our speakers today, we can all share. And I'm glad to welcome Laurent Scott de Martinville to the podium. So I would like to thank Her Excellency Madame Bréchignac, the French Ambassador for Science, Technology and Innovation, Secrétaire Perpétuel of the Academy of Sciences of the Institute of France, whose presence at this event is a great honor. It calls attention to this new uh, Franco-American achievement and contributes to the solemnity of the occasion. I would also like to express my gratitude to Professor David Edison Sloan, great-grandson of Thomas Edison, who's been kind enough to attend this ceremony, giving me the opportunity to create a link that my great-grandfather would have so much liked to have forged three generations ago. I would also like to thank our gracious and generous hosts for this occasion, Mrs. Stephanie Toothman, Associate Director for Cultural Resources, Partnerships and Science of the National Park Service, Mr. Tom Ross, Superintendent of the Thomas Edison National Historical Park. Mr. Jerry Fabris, Museum Curator of the Thomas Edison National Historical Park and today's <laughs> Program Chairman. I would also like to thank those who shone a light so clearly on the fact that Edward Leon was the first person to record sounds and particularly Mr. David Giovannoni of the First Sound Initiative and to whom, along with Mr. Fabris, we owe this symposium, and whom I've had the great pleasure of meeting numerous times over the years, and Mr. Patrick Feaster, also of the First Sounds Initiative, who tirelessly pursued his in-depth work on the first recordings of sound. Well, finally, I'd like to offer my heartfelt thanks to all of you for your participation in this symposium, which marks with perfect timing and symbolism, the bicentenary of my great-grandfather's birth. This event brings me great joy, and I'm delighted to share it with you. Thank you very much. And um, on behalf of the park and the National Park Service, I do want to thank our uh, first speakers for uh, their wonderful words and um, inspiring opening remarks here uh, today, this afternoon, at our symposium. Um, so how about another round of applause for uh, those great, great remarks. <laughs> 